name's Dawn Truck, and today we're going to do another session on poetry. And our focus today is going to be on rhythm and sound, and how we change poems through a wordplay and the order of words and the types of words we use into a kind of song. Song is really important in poetry, and not the kind of song that we sing, like la 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 la. But the song that um, just kind of amplifies the musicality of the poem. So there's a kind of music or beat or something like that. And you can you can turn poems into songs with music in the background or sing them. That's what we do with spoken word. That's some of the hip hop artists start with like like talking in certain rhythms and things like that with music in the background. So what I'm going to do, I'm very excited about this today. Um, is I'm going to take the last poem I wrote in our last session, the one about the bees and the bee man. Um, it's called Community. And I'm going to change it totally using these practices of what I call fix-ups or revisions to make it more uh, focused on sound and rhythm. So this is the original one. Community. And I just want to say I will still save this as a different poem. But um, you can make many versions of poems. And if you go to an art gallery, like you'll see um, some famous artists and you'll see the sketches of their drawings and then you'll see the paintings and the different studies of the same thing over and over sometimes. So that's what we're doing today, but in poetry. So the poem's called Community. The bees do their bee thing. The bee man of West Texas just died. Can anyone replace him? Where will we get our honey? What happens when the whole town runs out of honey? We can live without honey. And we can't replace the bee man, Wilburn Elliot. But the bees continue to buzz, carry pollen from the flowers back to the hives. Someone will rise up and raise the bees. Even though the bees don't need raising, they are born knowing what they need to do. I wish I was born knowing what I need to do, what my job is in the hive. I listen for the buzz of the all, my town, my community, to move me. I always wanted to be the bee man I always wanted Wilburn to teach me his bee ways, but that's not where I'm sent. I'm putting words on paper and showing you how to put words on paper. We are learning together how to speak our truth. So there we have this uh, poem about a bee man, but also about our own connection to this idea of a collective work, collective roles in the community trying to figure out like where our what our job is within like the whole of things and um, but I just want to make it and see if we can tighten up some of the words and um, switch up some of the words to make it sing a little more so what I want to talk about is rhythm to start with and we have these this idea of syllables right so the bees do their bee thing. So all of these words are just one syllable. There's not like two parts to it. And, and it goes, the bees do their bee thing, right? So, but some of the words we emphasize more. Like there's littler words like the and their. And they, um, and even kind of do, it could be. Um, these words aren't doing as much work. They don't have as much weight, as much meaning. We don't say them as um, emphasized or as strong as other words. So this is what we call when we call finding the rhythm. And it's also called, the fancy word for it is scansion. Because we're scanning the line of the poem to see what the different words um, which of the different words we emphasize more, and it has a kind of rhythm to it. So the the is kind of like a, you do it like this with a little u over it. If it's if it's not very um, strong of a, 
of a beat, and then the stronger ones, you do a line over that. And that's just fancy stuff. You don't need to know that, really. But it helps me see the rhythm The bees do. And I think this is a strong one, too, their bee thing. So actually, it's interesting because we have a, an unstressed syllable. That's what we call, like, one sound that just is, like, two syllables would be, or uh, three syllables would be anyone. That's three, anyone. So, okay, so we see that we have an unstressed or unstrong syllable with bees do that are both strong, unstressed syllable, and then two strong. So we have a little pattern there, and, and we'll just clap it out since we're looking at rhythm. The bees do the bee thing, right? So you have a sound there, and it's, it's, a, it's a good song sound, the bees do the bee thing. But we could also um, tighten it up or change it up a little bit. So I'm going to write it here. We might only do one or two lines today because there's so much you can do with two lines. But we'll get through as much of the poem as we can. Okay, so I'm just going to write it here. And we're just going to play around with changing up the words. We'll change up the words and um, and to see if we can play around with the rhythm and find other rhythms. And I just love changing the words in poems. Sometimes we can feel like whatever word we write down, we have to keep like it's golden or something like that. And they all are golden. Everything we write is golden and important. But I, my favorite part of poetry is playing around with the words. Um, I even do some things where I like cut words out of magazines and, and move them around like a puzzle so you can just play around and see the different ways words can go together. I would do that all day, every day, if I didn't have to have another job. All right, the bees do their bee thing. So what if I just take this off and I went bees, and um, bees, and um, how about if I just do all strong words? Bees buzz. Working, we'll do one. Working for honey. That sounds like they're working for money, but they're not, and I don't even know about the honey. Um, so this would be different, right? So bees buzz working for Honey. So bees buzz working for honey. Bees buzz working for honey. So that's another rhythm that we could do. And I also like to look at um, saw, uh, poems in terms of if you have a lot of little words that are less descriptive, like bees, honey, buzz, those are words that are really descriptive and they have a cool sound like the word buzz. And that's, that's an onomatopoeia word because the word sounds like what it is, like bees buzz, right? So that's just a fancy word for it sounds like, or it's a, or it's a short version of um, a word that sounds like what it is. My mask is falling. Okay. So that's one way we can do it. So you have an idea of the different rhythms. And now I'm going to try to add with this, this idea of changing up the sounds in a way where we really notice how the sounds go together or are different. So if you see B and buzz, then that is called alliteration. And again, I don't really care if anyone learns these words. It just helps me make categories for things. So when you have, um, these are vowels, right? E, A, E, I, O, U. But when we have um, consonants that um, match up, it's called alliteration. So let's see if we can play around with some alliteration and also what they call assonance, which is when the the vowels match up. We don't have any really matching up, they're all different. 
E U O I. We have O. Um, okay, so. Um, ooh, this is what I want to do. I think it would be fun to just to play around with words. Bees be cool. <laughs> Bees be cool. And, that, and that's not proper grammar, right? But it's kind of like a. A, a fun way of saying, bees be cool. Um, another way to say it would be, uh, bees buzz uh, I'm gonna just write a list of B words here. Now I can't think of any B words. I say B words all day. And then I like to do, when I got to battle, it made me want to say rattle. And right now, I don't know if any of these words will go into the poem, but it's just helping me play around with how we can think about sounds moving one to the other. And that makes me think of rattlesnakes because the place where this poem is about has a lot of hypo rattlesnap. That's kind of a fun word. I don't know what that would be a rattlesnap. Rattle, um, rumble. I kind of, so I just play around with the next word that comes to mind based on how things sound to me. And then bumble, bumblebees. Now, bumblebees aren't the ones that make this honey. And then simple, so bumble, so it goes battle, rattle, rumble, bumble, simple. So can you hear some of the, it's like a word, like a sound echo. We have the two T's with battle, the two T's with rattle, and the, the T-T-L, and, and the, actually A-T-T-L-E and then rumble and bumble, and then simple, you just change the first two letters. So it has a kind of a sound echo. So, so I could say bees buzz, snakes rattle. And I, I could say like, uh, walking through the desert, is a battle because you have to watch out for <laughs> I'm gonna put desert up here and we'll fix it up when I'm ready that again. And then I want to put the bee man in here. Bees buzz, snakes rattle, walking through the desert is a battle. Um, goat heads are these little prickly things that you can get in your feet where they pop your your tires of your, they're like little seed pods, but they have like really spiky, they're like this tiny and they have really spiky things coming out of them, just a couple of me. They can go through your foot or they can like pop a bike, bicycle tire, they can get in my dog's foot, feet when I live there. Walking through the desert is a battle. So I think I want to talk also about scorpions and goat heads. So as you can see, when you start to fix up a poem or change it, it might change entirely. We'll still have the bee man poem, but I kind of found that it might be interesting to look at what the place where the bee man lives is like, and then we can maybe add it to the poem or just have like a series of poems about this place in West Texas. And it's a place I used to live. I could maybe, you know, and then it makes me think, if I'm gonna have a series of poems in West Te about West Texas, then maybe I can um, talk about different people there, and especially the people who, who died since I left there. So, Bees be cool, bees buzz, snakes rattle. Walking through the desert is a battle. Watch for goat heads.
rush for goat heads, and javelina. Javelina are these like, they're like wild hog looking animals that have large tusks on them. And my dogs used to like to try to chase them and that's not so safe. Walking through the desert is a battle. Watch for goat heads and javelina. The first part of javelina kind of is like battle, have, you know, has that sound, so it kind of works. So that's, I'm going to write this out again so we can see what we have and play with the rhythm. Okay, here's our poem. Um, and we're going to do what, you know, the scansion. We're going to count the, um, mark the syllables. So you have bees, buzz, snakes, rattle, walking through the desert is a bad Watch for both heads and have a lean. So I even wonder if we could have less of the unstressed, the quieter syllables. So I'm going to try to, and that's also a practice in poetry called, um, I'll make a little list of words we're in. We're going to condense the poem, where we take out like the unnecessary words or the extra words. So I always feel like every word has to count. Like if you have to buy, uh, if you have like, I don't know, five thousand dollars to buy words, um, you want to you want to really use your money, your money well. So I don't know. That's just a weird um, way to talk about it. So if you have these buzz. Snakes rattle. I think instead of walking through the desert, I could just say um, desert walks are a battle. Because these are like words that don't do as much work, they're kind of connecting words. How about our battles? Watch for goat heads and Halloween. Goat heads and um, Okay. Bees buzz, snakes battle, desert walks are battles. Watch for goat heads and Halloween. Okay, now I don't know where I want to go. So I'm just going to say, watch for goat heads and have a lean. I just want to go to lunch. Like, I want to say, like, have a sandwich. <laughs> I like the things that come to my mind right now. It's like eating a sandwich and turning a pirouette. I don't know why. That's what I see. Like, I want something crazy to have, happen in the desert. Like, take out your sandwich, eat it, and then, and then, um, um do like dance on the on the high desert highway or on the high desert ranch road. Watch for goat heads and have a I'm not gonna go there with that because I wanna keep describing this. I can borrow that for another kind of imaginative piece or a little story. I think that's the thing when you're writing, you can always if you have ideas you don't have to cram them all into one piece. You can write them down on another piece. Um, but I just like the idea of this person walking across like there's these roads in West Texas where um, they're like near ranches, they're on ranches and you just walk and it's just like high desert all around. And Havilene, um, oh, okay, there's these plants and, and you know, there's lots of cactus and stuff in the desert, but there's also these plants that are called Spanish daggers. I don't even know if that's the real name for it, but they have, they kind of have these, um, they kind of look like like, they have these big leaves that are kind of like succulents, I think. But they have these beautiful cream-colored flowers that bloom. But they're called Spanish daggers, which sounds dangerous, right? And Spanish daggers... Are, I don't know, like, Spanish daggers are in bloom. That's kind of the rhythm I get. Bees buzz, snakes rattle, desert walks, our battles. Watch for goat heads and have a lean. 
Spanish daggers. <laughs> uh, Spanish daggers are, I want to say, are a dream. And because it, I don't know, watch for go heads and have a woman. Spanish daggers are a dream. But they're not, a, uh, that doesn't make sense. So, um, so that's kind of the rhythm I'm picking up. These buzz, snakes rattle, desert walks are battles. Watch for goat heads and javelina, Spanish daggers aren't so mean. Uh, <laughs> so, so we'll just, I'm going to take a pause right there and see if, you know, this is where I'm like just thinking about it. And I like to call it like cooking. Like you write a poem and then you let it, like you put it on simmer for a while and then you come back to it and see if it thickened or you, or you found a different way to uh, go with it because I don't want to force it right now. Sometimes you just have to force poems. Like if you're, if that's what you're doing, writing poems, um, then you just want to play with it and push it. But I also want to try some more of the B map. So we'll put this to the side for now and we will um, look at, yeah, we really went off course with the B map. And this, you could even say, the bees do their blue thing. And I like that, I think it's kind of funny, like blue thing, and we know what that means. Um, but I'm wondering just to, to try to find a word that's more specific or um, more, like uses rhythm and sound more. I could say the bees do their best bee dance. The bees do their best bee dance. And then it could be maybe I could show that they're doing that when, uh, you know, for Wilbur and Elliot after he dies, like that's the way of celebrating their keeper, the person who stewarded their work. You know, they could do it without him, but it's like, I can imagine that the bees have a relationship with him. And he was pretty amazing. Like he wasn't scared of bees. I never saw him go, I would go visit his place and he didn't wear the big white thing that looked like a hazmat suit. So let's try to more carefully stick with this topic. Um, so we've done two things. We've played around with it and discovered a whole new poem, which is kind of fun. And now we can go back to this. And I'm excited about this idea that it's kind of like the Bees Memorial Service for William Eller Elliot. The first poem we wrote was more about like, what will the people do now that Wilbur and Elliot is gone? And now this is what the bees will do now that he's gone. Like, how will they find their, their place in the world? What, you know, this idea that they could go wild and just maybe honey for honey's sake. Okay. Um, the bees. Is that good? The bees. Poetry involves being quiet for long periods of time. So I'm just going to sit here and think. But um, that would be boring for you, so we'll keep going. The, be the bees do. The bees. How about the bees dance? A bee dance. Um. Their bee, their keeper. Die. The bees dance and bee dance. Their keeper died. Now I want to see if I can find a way that the sound sounds better. The bees dance, the bee dance, the keeper died. Um, so there's two things going on with this. I feel like the sounds kind of don't sound that great together. 
the B's dance, a B dance. I don't mind the repetition. Sometimes repetition is really cool because um, it has like an echo or a playfulness. Um, I mean, maybe we could start. Okay, I just wrote out this thing. I just had this, like, the words just came out. That doesn't usually happen. You usually have to pause and think and cross things out. And, and I'll probably cross things out here, too. When Wilburn dies and flies through the bees into the sky, searching what's after for a new home, the bees he left behind dance on their own. And I kind of feel like it has a sense of, you know, um, home and own are rhyming, but we call it near rhyme. So it's like they have sounds that are alike, um, that rhyme. And really in today's poetry world, even though some people write poems and rhyme, most of the poems that are published in the world, and certainly like poems for youth, or like there's still like um, sing song poems or um, like nursery rhymes that kind of have that sense of um, old mother hover went to her cover and now I can't remember what it is. Um, so we still have poems like that but usually most people that publish poems in magazines or, or, these, or these journals or books that are just devoted to poems don't have that many poems but I really like the use of near rhyme because it has that sense of sound like. So when Wilbur dies and flies through the bees into the sky, searching what's after for a new home, the bees he left behind dance on their own. So we have, um, we have dies and flies, and that's called, because it's not usually rhymes, like the old-fashioned rhymes come at the end of the lines, but we have, this is called internal rhymes. Um, again, these words don't matter, and some of them might be like, what? But I just want to talk about, I just want to give you, you know, the real terms for them. When Wellburn dies and flies to the bees, into then you have sky too, so you have these three, these three rhymes. Searching what's after, and that's like what, what's after his life. For a new home, with this idea that like after he dies, so He'll find a new place to live, right? Whatever that means to him. Heaven or um, the stars or something like that. The bees he left behind dance on their own. So that's, um, that's a way that we can talk about more or less about the people that Wilburn leaves behind and more about his journey after death and his bees' journey after he dies. So I'm going to think about, we're going to think about what happens to the bees after it. We might not follow where Wilburn goes because I don't want to try to imagine that for him because I don't know what his beliefs were. But I want to go back to this poem and add a little bit more about what the bees, um, you know, what the bees are doing, where they find their new home, or if they go um, 
find a new wild home or if they stay there and just kind of become like their own keepers or if another person comes in and keeps them. So I'm gonna make another page. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna do, I'm gonna look at the rhythm of this and I kinda of like the way it sounds. I mean, we can read it, I'll just read it without emphasizing the rhythm. The bees dance a bee dance, the keeper died. Oh wait, no, that was the first one. Just cut that out. Okay. When Wilburn dies and flies through the bees into the sky, searching what's after for a new home, the bees he left behind dance on their own. So you can see when I read that, I was reading more for meaning and less for emphasis on the sound. Because I also can do like, when Wilburn dies and flies through the bees into the sky, searching what's after for a new home, the bees he left behind dance on their own. And you can almost do that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a spoken word poet or a hip hop artist, obviously. I would think that would be kind of weird if I was a hip hop artist, but I would be like, um, searching what's after for a new home, the bees he left behind dance on their own. Okay, now you can make fun of me. All right, so I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna do this and then we're going to, um, we're gonna look at a new section after this um, and try to build something else. When, okay, so when Will Burn dies, oops, no, that was that. When Will Burn dies, so that has like, da, 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 and flies through the bees into the, the sky into the sky and you can see this one has regular rhythm da, 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 da. and then these break it up so you can play around with that because if you keep it all the same it can lull you into a sense of like da, 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 da. and that can be a certain thing you want to do like i feel like it almost feels like you're on a boat rocking into the sky Searching what after sometimes I sometimes I want to do after searching and for a new home the bees he left behind dance on their own. All right, so that's, and you can see everyone has like a certain, a different kind of rhythm pattern. So you can look for patterns. And I, I think it's, it's kind of interesting. And the, you know, the way that I learned to look for rhythms was in, you know, Shakespeare, the famous playwright, like all of, not all of his, not, not the whole plays were written like this, but he had most of it was written in this da 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 and that was just like more the formal way that people wrote in those days when they wrote plays and poetry um, but when you read it you don't have to read it like that you don't have to go you don't have to go um, in that so when Wilburn dies I could do it like that or I could be when Wilburn dies you know? so I'm, I'm reading it like that to emphasize it to you so that is how we do rhythm. And I want to work a little bit more on um, sound play, but I'm going to just look at the rhythm of this whole page first. And I want to talk about why um, this kind of writing feels a little bit more like a story than a poem, even though I really like it. And that has to do with the language and the kind of relaxed nature of it. Whereas poems don't have to be confusing or like pushed together so much that you have to untangle the words. Sort of like, like in here I would say searching what's after instead of searching for what's after or searching for what's after death. I, I kind of make it where you have to 
just get the idea of what that means based on the context, but the, um, you know, based on the rest of the poem and, and this idea, it does make sense searching what is after, because it's like, he's searching for what's after, but he's also like, just kind of, okay, now he's after, he's like after death. And he's just going through whatever's after, like he's just kind of, because he flies through the bees. And so it's like, if you're swimming in the ocean or in somewhere where there's fish and you're looking, you know, you're looking for, you're snorkeling or whatever, and you're like searching the water, right? So he's searching what's after. So it means kind of both. And that's where, where poetry can be. I don't like to think of it as tricky, but it like makes your mind work a little more. And the person who's reading the poem gets to bring their meaning to it as well. Okay, so so I'll talk a little bit more about the rhythm here and how we can we can condense it a little bit to make it more to sound more poetic and less the word that's like the opposite of poet poetic or poet poetry is called prose, and it just means it's more. Um, like longer, it's like sentences, and again, the, the words go all the way to the end of the page, and it has a little bit more of a relaxed feeling about it. Um, so, the bee man of West Texas just died. So that would be just a sentence. I mean, that just might be in the newspaper or something you see on social media. The bee man of West Texas just died. Wilbur Elliott died in his sleep on, you know, this date. And in fact, he just died like a, um, two weeks ago. Um, so how could we take this one, the bee man of West Texas just died? And believe me, I like this poem as it is. Um, and I think it would be really nice to send to his family and his friends in West Texas because I, I, like, I like it. But let's talk about how we can condense it. And I'm trying to think, like, I don't know if you've ever seen, seen it, but it's these cans of sweetened condensed milk. And you sometimes use it when you're making um, pies or other kinds of like, um, desserts. And it's like milk, but it's like thicker because they take out more of the water. So we're taking out more of the, like, we're just taking out more of the water, I guess, more of the the parts of the of the sentence that are um, um, see through, right? And we're trying to get more of the the solids in there. We can talk about these as solid words. Can you tell that I'm not only a poet, I'm a baker because I talk a lot about um, examples that have to do with cooking. Okay, so we're going to condense it. The bee man of West Texas just died. So, I could talk about the actual town. So I could say, Martha, it's a funny, it's a funny um, name for a town. Martha's Bee Man, and that's what they call them, the Bee Man. Martha's Bee Man um, Bar Martha's Bee Man, so I don't have the, I don't have the, and West Texas is um, even though it's very specific, it's the sounds of it are things like that we've heard before, West Texas, so we don't think about it as much as Martha's B-Man. Um, or I could say Martha, Texas. Well, that might be hard. Martha's B-Man. Um, Die. the high desert. 
<laughs> That's actually supposed to be two words. High desert. Ah. I want to say, like, instead of diet, another word, even though that's what happened, right? Martha's B man left this world. Martha's B man left, whoops. How about left his hive? Because he like left his beehive behind, but he also left the community, like his community, his own hive in this town of, of Martha. Martha's bee man left his hive. Um, and then the next line is, can anyone replace him? So, you know, that could be, can anyone, who can take his place? And also the name for Bima has apiarist. Um, I'll just write it up here. I think I'm writing it wrong, but apiarist. Because um, a beehive is an apiary. And um, left is hive. and having to try to put mine to be around. <laughs> and there I just said that we don't really write anymore, but if you wanted to turn it into a like a song, left is high, left is tail, honey deprived, right? So so that's a way that we can um, we can make a choice where we change the words so more of the words carry more weight. I mean the words the and of um, just are really important words because they help us understand or create a whole, you know, understand the sentence or create a whole sentence. But in poetry, we want to figure out a way to do that with using less of those words so it's more, so there's more a sense of song and more a sense of like every word counting. Because it, when every word counts, you can see the words more. They don't get buried in these sentences that have a lot of smaller words in them. Uh, Martha's bee man left his hive, left his town, honey deprived. So that is a way that we play, and it has some sound. And we can even play more, you know how you have left two, um, which I kind of like that repetition there, but I feel like those words could even be stronger. But we don't want like a word that stands out so much that like all the other words seem like they don't fit. You know, when you wear a mask, you really have to have your nose covered too, because that's where everything comes up. All right, now I'm going to do some more sound check. So what I want to do is, I did that little list on the side of one of these um, fix-ups or, or play pages that I did. Play pages, I like that word for what we do with work. But I want to give you a sense of an idea of how you, instead of thinking that the next, thinking about the next word in terms of its meaning and how it makes sense with the other words. The choices that you'll make with this exercise will be solely based on the sound, only based on what you think sounds good next to it, without even thinking about the meaning. So they might not seem to make any sense at all. And this is, um, people write like this, and I can, um, you know, give you examples of it if you want to get in touch with but we're going to make an example of it now, and hopefully you're going to make examples of it now. All right, so I think the word, let's see if I can find the word that I can start with. Sometimes I just open a dictionary. I don't know if you still have dictionaries. and just like close my eyes and point to a word to start with. Um, Okay, I'm going to start with two one, and then we'll just see where it goes, and I'm going to put the paper like this. So,
just go with some lines because that's what's. I don't have to keep all of it. Go parallel. Yeah. So. Do. I know that's not exactly the same, but it has a bit a similar sound to me. Do. Um, I keep thinking of these words and I'm not writing them down, which is like what I would tell you not to do, that you should just write things down, but I'm afraid it's going to be stupid. So, I mean, I want you also to notice that if your head is telling you things like don't write it down, because no one has to see this. I mean, you're seeing this because I'm demonstrating this to you. So I'm going to try to get out of my editor, and even if I think it's stupid, I'm just going to write what comes to you next. So... I want to say, as I'm writing this, I noticed that even though I gave you the instructions to um, think about the next word in terms of what, like the sound, like how it changes with sound, I'm doing a couple of different things in that. I noticed that I'm also doing just with what it looks like. So I have the B O and the B O, and then I have the vowel. You know, I just want the O, Ws, and some of this in the O, Ow, and O. So I think what I ended up doing was not just about sound. It was like the look of the words or the letters in the words. Go, cow, wow, meow, so, sow, do, fo, money. I don't even know why I put money, but me, um, because the knee, money, apogee, free, and don't. And I think I was like, Apple do free and dumb, and I think that was like that. So um, if I just do sounds, I'm gonna turn the paper like this. I'm gonna try to force myself to really think about sounds. And I think I need to not look at the page to do that, because when I'm looking at the letters, I get really into the letters. Um, so I'm gonna go with, um, I'm gonna take the word bold. I'm doing it again, bull and howl. They don't sound alike at all. Bull, will, so. Low. Pull, no, that's, that's letters too. Oh my gosh, so this is like a default in me and I'm trying to I didn't even know it, that when I'm making these lists that I'm doing it more based on what I see in the letters. So go, and then, because I was going to put um, something else. Low, lullaby, nine. Wait, I think I can spell that right. And chum, chow, chow, wild. I feel like whenever I want to make a rhyme, I try to stop myself. Like I feel like that's too easy to just write. So I'm just going to get all the rhymes out. Wild, mild. Um, I, I don't know. Now I want to say curtail for some reason. Not the same, but it has like the ale, you know, mild ale. Wild, mild, curtail, curtain. Certain. Some of these words are big, and I don't expect people to know what they mean. And I don't even know if I for sure know exactly what they're meeting. Certitude, maybe it's not even a word. Attitude. Oh, brood. I love that word. So I'd say, hang on, brood, and just feel sorry for myself. I'm a little bit mad at the same time. 
Attitude Brew, um, Brew, like Witch's Brew, Coo. Like, I like the idea of Brew and Coo together because Brew like, is like a Witch's Brew, and it's also like if you're brewing up a plan, like it's kind of something that comes together in a magical way. And then Coo is like a dark cream, right? So these two words you wouldn't normally see together. And that's sort of the idea of doing um, sound work is you can, like sound, they call it sound generated poetry because you're making or generating, like creating um, a list of words or a poem based on um, like what you think would be a sound that would lead you from the last sound. And sometimes you end up with words that you wouldn't normally see together. And the point of that, or the reason we want to do that, is because sometimes there's words that we hear so often, and we just know what they mean, and we don't think about them anymore. And in my experience, or my goal as a poet, is to help people um, see the world again either see it in new ways or remember to see things that they take for granted. So brew and coo make this um, this idea of you know seeing these in different ways. So I don't even know what a brew coo would be um, but maybe you're brewing up the coos like like maybe you're a magician who takes like the sound of doves and puts them in a pot and like makes a brew of it that's like magical. So it kind of helps me think of those words in new ways. And so I'm excited. I hope that you'll practice what we did here and take a poem um, that maybe you wrote last session and play around with it in terms of the rhythm. And I'm gonna write down some of the words we, we learned today. So scansion. That means when you're looking at the poem and marking like which of the syllables are strong or what we call stressed and which of the syllables are unstressed or like a little, I don't like to say weak because that's kind of judgmental. So that's scansion. We talked about condensing poems, which is taking out like all the extra words and trying to find new words. Like if you have to, to make um, each of the words count more. We um, talked about alliteration, which is when you have like words that go together where um, the consonant, uh, the consonants like like um, long, long ladder, you know, long ladder, walls, that kind of thing. And then we talked about assonance. And that's when the vowel sounds go together, like owl, vowel, and like that. Okay, and then we talked about, if I can spell it right, onomatopoeia. That might have an extra word, <laughs> an extra letter in it. Onomatopoeia. Um, and that is when, that was like the word buzz, where the word sounds like what this, you know, the word um, mimics the sound that it's describing. So, like the word owl, you know, you would actually say owl. Um, or the word uh, new, or things like that. So, I really appreciate you coming and. Um, watching this session, and I, I'm excited about the work you will do with sound and rhythm and making poetry into song. Thanks.